Hello! In this video, you'll learn about a recursion implemented in Python and applied to different fields. Sorry, mate, what's the, the video about? Hello! In this video, you'll learn about a recursion implemented in Python and applied to different fields. Sorry, mate, what's the, the video about? Informally, we can define a recursive procedure as a procedure that invokes itself multiple times. There's a difference between iteration and recursion. The former is all about repeating patterns or calling the same function multiple times, but in a linear manner, for example, in a for loop. The latter, recursion, has a particular property that's being self-referential because it's each recursive procedure continuously calls itself. Recursion has application in many fields. Of course, the first that come to mind are mathematics and computer science programming. But recursion is also fruitfully used in other fields, like for example, language and linguistics, as well as in the arts and in music. In this video, I'm gonna show you how you can implement in Python recursive functions in most of these fields. We'll particularly be focusing on music or recursion in music and how to generate recursive music. And if you're wondering why, probably you've never been to the Sound of AI channel, which is all about AI, music and audio processing. Have I asked you already to subscribe to the channel? Let me show you a few examples of recursion. The first one is matryaskas. That's the ultimate example of recursion. You have a pattern that repeats itself, that calls itself, that calls itself in a smaller fashion, that calls itself, calls itself until potentially infinity. Now, uh, here's another example from one of my favorite painters, Moritz Cornelis Escher. That's drawing hands, and here you have a hand that draws another hand that draws the initial hand that draws the other hand in this sort of infinite a recursive process. Let's take a look also at a more mundane example of recursion that I face every time I do a screen cap using a software called OBS. So as you can see, this is the software that I'm currently using for uh, recording this video. And the software has here at the center a window that's um, sort of like uh, gives us back the window that it is recording. But of course, that is open to recursion because the window has itself another window inside that has itself another window, another window, and so on and so forth until potentially we reach infinity. So far, we've talked about a recursion quite informally. If you want to define a recursion more formally, at least for mathematics and computer science, we should say that a recursive behavior is defined by two properties. A base case, which is a terminating scenario that produces an answer without relying on recursion, and a recursive step, that's a set of instructions that produce all these successive case until we get to the base case. It's important to say that it is possible to have recursive behavior without a base case, but in that case, we would have infinite recursion. I'd like to show you the formal definition of the recursive behavior using a function that's quite common in mathematics and computer science. That's the factorial. Most of you would be familiar with that, but factorial five, for example, is equal to five times four times three times two times one. We can generalize this expression to have factorial of n, which is equal to n times n minus one times n minus two times n minus three and so on and so forth. We can notice something interesting here and that we could substitute this expression, so n minus one times n minus two and times n minus three and so on and so forth as this, as a factorial of n minus one. Because as you can see, this is really the definition of the factorial because here the factorial of n minus one is equal to n minus one times n minus two times n minus three and so on and so forth. Right, so let's do this substitution. And here you can see that we can rewrite factorial uh, of n as a function of factorial, the factorial function itself. So we're 
basically writing a function reusing the function itself. And it's something to notice here also is that factorial of n minus 1 is equal itself to n minus 1 times factorial n minus 2. In other words, here we could have a bunch of recursive calls to the same factorial function in order to calculate the factorial of n. So, as you can see here, we've defined the recursive step for factorial. What's missing is the base case, and the base case is this one. So, the factorial of 1 is equal to 1. Now, let's move from this mathematical definition to a Python implementation of factorial so that this will become clear. We define factorial like this. Factorial takes an n argument that's an int, and here we should differentiate between the base case and the uh, recursive step. So if n is equal to 1, then we'll return 1, and that's the base case. And as you can see here, there is no trace of a recursive call. And then we have the recursive step, and in this case, we just return n times factorial of n minus 1. That's the definition of our recursive step for factorial. Now, let's run this with a script. And as you can see, factorial 5 is 120 as expected. Next, I want to show you the order of the different recursive calls to factorial when we enter the function and when we exit it. For that, I'm going to add a few print statements. Let's run the script once again and let's examine the print statements that will be a proxy to the uh, stack and the function calls. Cool. As you can see, we enter the factorial with n equal to 5, and then we go down the stack, entering all the other factorial uh, functions, but with n equal 4, 3, 2, 1, until we get to the base case. And at this point, we return the results starting from the uh, lower part of the stack. So when we are here at the base case and then we go up and return. This is the typical call behavior for recursive functions. We go down the stack entering all the functions and then we go up the stack once again with return values until we get the final result. Admittedly, implementing the factorial function for showcasing recursion isn't the most exciting thing ever, but I think it's quite effective because it's simple enough. But let's move on to something way more interesting, and that's language. Linguist Noam Chomsky has discovered that the human language is characterized by recursion. In other words, humans, when communicate among themselves, can create infinitely recursive sentences. What this means is that the sentences that we create can embed other sentences that can embed other sentences. I know this may sound a little bit weird, so you know what? We're going to implement a recursive sentence generator in Python. Sentences are made up of clauses or parts of sentences. A recursive sentence is one where a close embeds another close that embeds another close and so on and so forth. Let's formalize this. We can say sentence is equal to close that embeds another close that embeds another close and we could continue indefinitely until infinity but here we're going to just put a base that's the case that we want to actually reproduce. Okay, so let me close this. So it's one, two, three parentheses. Okay, but you may be wondering what's a close? Okay, close, an example of a close could be a name plus a verb plus that. Let me give you an example, an actual example of a close. So it could be something like Jane 
thinks that. And when you embed a second clause, you could do something like this. Jane thinks that Anna supposes that, right? So this way you can embed clauses within clauses. Now, what I want to build is a recursive sentence generator that is a, that utilizes this approach. It has a base so that we don't have infinite recursion and it uses this type of clause where we have a name, a verb, and that. I copy paste a list of names and verbs so that we can add variety to the generation of clauses. Then we implement the main generator that takes three arguments, a levels, that are the recursion levels that we want, names and a list of verbs. We trigger the base case once levels hit one and we return a string, I love recursion. In the recursive step, we do two things. First of all, we generate a close by chaining together a random name, a random verb and that, and then we chain the newly generated closes with a new call to uh, the generator function where we decrease by one the levels. Let's generate now a recursive sentence with 20 levels of recursion. Malirio thinks that Julio is afraid that Jane is afraid that Malirio ignores that Joel says that Julio suspects that Andrew is afraid that Anna has inferred that Natasha ignores Yo, that was crazy, wasn't it? The problem is that we can't really pass and track all of those embedded clauses in embedded clauses. Probably I think humans do well with two to three embedded clauses, but more than that, it starts being very difficult to follow the uh, thread of a sentence. Another interesting application of recursion is within the visual domain and the arts. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples here with Python, and we'll start by drawing a squared spiral using recursion. To draw our shapes in Python, we'll be using the Turtle library. This is a graphics library that provides us with a canvas where we can draw upon using simple method calls. To install Turtle, you can use pip. Go to a console and then type pip install Turtle. I already have installed it. Now let's take a look at the script where I have the function for drawing our squared a spiral. But first of all, let's take a look at what we want to create. And it's this shape here, a squared spiral. Okay. So first of all, we import turtle. We instantiate a turtle object, which is the one that has all the methods for drawing on the canvas. Then we go to a this coordinate here. This basically is done to center the cursor and then we decide the speed six is normal drawing speed and then we have the definition of the draw spiral function this is a recursive and it takes three arguments the turtle object the line length and the line offset so the line length is the length of the initial line here then the offset that we have here is the distance between the an external line and a the embedded like the the other one and it's basically like this amount of distance here that's equal to this one for example and that's equal to um, this one the function definition features only the recursive step the base case does nothing so we can just ignore it or otherwise we could do something like this else return but that's verbose so we just uh, remove it now what happens in the recursive step? Well, first of all, we have to enter the recursive step and we can enter if and only if this statement is respected. And at this point, we do three things. First, we move forward by the uh, line length and then we turn right by 90 degrees. What this means visually is that we do something like this. We go forward and then we return right 
like this. Then there's a recursive call to draw spiral, but in this case, when we pass the line length, we modify this variable by subtracting the line offset. Let's run draw spiral with a line length of 400 and a line offset of 5. And here you have it, the design. And it's quite cool because it does it in uh, real time. And it continues, it continues until it reaches the end. And that's it. I'll show you another example of how we can use a recursion to create interesting visuals. In this case, we'll be using Turtle to draw the Sierpinski Triangle, which is an amazing fractal. I'm not gonna dive into the code, but if you want, you can do it by yourself because you'll find the, this script as well as all the code for the other scripts that you have in this video in the description box below. We've implemented a bunch of examples of recursion in different domains. What remains to be done is the most exciting part, which is creating some routines that can use recursion to generate recursive music. But while it's relatively easy to understand what's recursive behavior in domains like language, the visual domain or mathematics, it remains to be seen what recursion in music really sounds like. The concept of recursion in music can be applied in many different manners, but in order to understand it, we need to understand another concept connected to symbolic music, that's that of a piano roll. This is a way of representing music in a sort of greed. The greed has two axes, the Y axis that represents pitches, or in other words, the frequencies that we have, and on the X axis, we have time. Now, each event that you have in this grid is an event that has a certain pitch, so it has a certain frequency, and then it has a certain duration. Wait! If you want to know more about pitch, frequencies and sound, check out this video. I've borrowed the concept of recursion applied to music from this paper from 2017. This is a music cognition paper that tries to understand whether we humans can perceive recursive structure in music. Spoiler alert! We can! Here's how the authors have implemented the concept of recursion in music. They start with a piano roll with a very long-held note. Then at iteration two, they add a pattern that's uh, embedded time-wise in the initial longer note. We have three notes that go up in pitch and they are shorter than the original note. Then at iteration three, we take this pattern and we embed it within each of these notes. But at this point, the uh, notes in the new patterns are shorter and at the same time, they are higher in pitch. They've been transposed up. Iteration four just does the same thing, but at a higher level of abstraction. Now, we can think of this uh, creation as a recursive creation that happens at different levels. We have level one, which is the long held note, then we have level two, level three, and level four. That's what we are gonna implement, more or less. Now, for implementing this concept of recursion music, we need two transforms. One is a transformation that allows us to transpose up pitch, the frequency, and the other one is a duration multiplier. We actually need to shrink the duration of the notes. Before I show you the code of the recursive music generator, I want to show you its design because it's a little bit more complex than what we've built so far. 
First, we have an abstract class that's called transform. This provides an interface and a public method called apply that allows us to apply the current transform. Apply takes a note that's a music 21 note object and it returns a music 21 note object. More on music 21 in a second. Then we have a couple of transforms that we actually implement and they uh, derive from transform this interface. One is called preach transposer that just transposes speech, which moves it up or down. And then we have duration multiplier that uh, multiplies the duration of a note by a certain factor. Then we have the core of the generative system that's called a recursive generator. Recursive generator uh, has a public method that generates a recursive score. Recursive generator owns one or multiple transforms and it uses these transforms to generate uh, the score. Then we have another couple of objects that are owned by a recursive generator. So one is a music 21 score object and another one is a music 21 part object. Now, what are these two things? Well, these are ways of representing music using a, an object oriented programming uh, paradigm. And that's provided by Music21, which is a library that allows us to represent music symbolically and to manipulate it. Specifically, the score object represents a music score and a score can have one or multiple parts. If you want to learn more about Music21, I have a video where I covered all of these concepts more in detail. I'll leave you the link up. Let's take a look at the code. First, we implement the transform class. This is a, an abstraction that has an abstract method applied that as we saw in the design, takes a note and returns a note. Then we have a couple of uh, classes which implement or inherit from transform. Pitch transposer at construction time takes a pitch offset. This is an int uh, that tells us if uh, the amount of pitches that we want to shift the note up or down. And that's what we do actually in the apply method that overrides the original abstract method. So here we calculate the transformed pitch by uh, applying the offset to the original pitch of the note that we pass in and then we return a new note that has the transformed pitch as well as the same quarter length uh, duration of the original note that we passed in. Now, uh, duration multiplier, uh, just as we saw, changes the duration of the original note that we pass. Of course, this is a transform uh, class. At in instantiation time, it takes a multiplier, that's a factor basically that we store in self dash multiplier. And then in the apply method that overrides the original uh, abstract method, we um, calculate the transformed duration by applying the multiplier to the original duration of the note and then we return a new music 21 note with the original pitch but with the new duration. Next we concentrate on the main class for this framework that's called recursive generator. At construction time recursive generator takes three arguments. One is a music 21 score, then the levels of recursion that we want and a list of transforms that we want to apply during generation. All of these arguments get stored in public um, attributes, but then we add a couple of private attributes that we'll discover later on. Before we move on, we should understand how we represent this recursive music using Music21. Okay, here you have an example of a piano roll that potentially could be generated by a recursive generator. You have uh, different levels, notes at different levels, each the different levels embed uh, themselves. So. How do we represent this with Music21? Well, we use parts and score. So each level 
is embedded within one part. So we have part one, here part two, and here part three. Then all the parts are embedded within a score object. Let's take a look at generate score. This is a recursive method that's responsible for generating the uh, music recursively, starting from an initial pattern. So as you can see here, this is a recursive function because it has a recursive step that ends with calling back the, the method itself, generate score, and it has a base case. But now let's understand how this function uh, works uh, using a visual representation. So what we do is starting from a score that has a part. So that's basically the basic pattern and that's what we usually pass in the constructor. Now, what we want to do is to create all the other levels starting from this initial pattern and this initial score. So the generate score function or method creates part two and creates part three and it can continue part four, part five, right? And at each iteration, well, not iteration, but function call, really, recursive function call, it generates a new part. We enter the recursive uh, step if and only if the current level is greater than zero. Then we do uh, multiple things. First, we generate a part, then we apply transformations to said part, and then we append said part to the score. Finally, we decrease the current level. And of course, we call generate score once again. Now, if current level goes down to zero, then we arrive at the base case that returns nothing, but it has the task to reset current level to levels. Let's take a look at the different functions that we have here. So generate parts and apply transformations to parts so that we see what they actually do. Let's start with gen oops, generate part. So in generate part, we create an empty music 21 part object and then we create some notes which we append to the part. Now, this is very interesting. So what we do with create notes is particularly interesting. This is quite complicated to understand from code. So I'm gonna give you the visual explanation instead. Create notes considers the last level that we've generated and it takes the basic pattern of that level and then it generates a list of notes that repeats the same initial pattern so that we have enough notes that we can embed in the previous level here. So as you can see here, we have four notes. So we repeat the original pattern twice so that each of these repetitions can be embedded in each of the notes of the original pattern. But of course, up until this point, these notes have the same pitch and the same um, uh, duration of the original pattern. And that's not what we want because we want to transform those notes. This is when apply transformations to part comes in place. This method goes through all the notes in the newly generated part and it applies all the transforms that we have stored in self.transforms. This visually means that we move from this situation here to this one when we apply, for example, the duration multiplier. In this case, we just like scale this down. Then if we apply a pitch transposer, we move up the notes so that we can just shift them and they will be embedded in the previous layer. These are all the components in a recursive generator. Now that you know how it behaves, let's try it out with a script. The MIDI file has been generated and we should have it here in the working directory. Yeah, there it is. I took the generated MIDI and imported it into BandLab, which is an online DO. I chose different instruments for different parts and added a bit. Here's the result.
The result is by no means a masterpiece, but I think it's quite interesting. You can hear all these patterns recursively embedded within other patterns and other patterns. I'm sure you could appreciate that. With this, we finished our journey in recursion. By now, you should have a good grasp of a recursion and how you can implement it into a number of different applications. If you're wondering, is recursion useful? Well, I have to say that most of the time it's preferable to use iteration rather than recursion, but recursion has something special for me. It's extremely concise and elegant. So I think it's definitely something that you should know if you want to call yourself a programmer. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found this video useful and I'll see you next time. Cheers.